Today, as you were told, we'll be talking about the heart of the matter. When you refer to getting to the heart of the matter, to what do you usually refer? What do you mean? What is the heart of the matter? I believe it is the, the, the central, the, the central core, the, the, the very essence of the matter. It is the equivalent of the American phrase, getting down to brass tacks. The heart of the matter then is what is at the center or the very core of the issue. Solomon got down to the brass tacks. The heart of the matter for us spiritually. And he states it succinctly as follows. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of humans. Yet, what does that have to do with today's study of Psalm 67? Good question, and thank you for asking. There's a literary device which was common during Bible times, and it's used by the Bible writers. It is known as a chiasm. They love it because it helps to take us down to the very heart of the matter. It is repetition of, a, of similar ideas, but repeating it in reverse order. The importance of the chiastic structure is found in its hidden emphasis that features the heart of the matter by placing the most important item at the center of the structure. That is, it sandwiches the most important element in the middle of things in a structure that is as follows, A, B, C, B, A. So A, B, C in the middle, then B, A. Let me illustrate that for us using um, <clears throat> Hebrews 12. And what I'd like to do, uh, if you have uh, your screens on, I'd like to share my screen for a minute. So uh, I'd like to ask the host to give me permission to share screen so you'll be able to see. What I'd like to notice is that if you look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Having seated around us such a great cloud of witnesses. B says, setting aside <clears throat> every weight that so easily beset us. C says, with endurance. D, let us run the race that is set before us. And notice E, which is the central thought, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And then if you look at the next D, who for the joy that was set before him, that is similar with let us run the race set before us. He, see, endure the race. We are asked to endure the race. He disregarded the disgrace. We are to set aside every weight and every entangling sin. And the A uh, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. And we have seated around us a great cloud of witnesses. So the most important thing, the heart of the matter, is fixing our eyes on Jesus, which suggests that um, Jesus' fixation, gazing on Jesus, 
is an imperative for Christians today. It is not something we can choose to do or choose not to do. It is an imperative. It's the only way to succeed in the Christian journey, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Now, if we take that to uh, our text for today, which is our, 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 our subject, which is Psalm 67, the entire Psalm is in a chiastic structure. And what is at the heart of the matter of that psalm is very important to us. First of all, I'd like to invite you, if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 67. And the first thing I'd like you to do is to look very carefully at the verbs in the psalm. They are significant. I invite you to take a good look at them. Bless, shine, praise, sing, rule, fear, just the name of you of them. Structurally, <clears throat> structurally, what we are observing here is that verses one and seven correspond. Verses Two and six correspond, as do verses three and five. This leaves us, verse four, at the heart of the matter, with the central thought of the psalm. So let's analyze it. Verse one opens with a call for God to be merciful to Israel. And cause God's face to shine upon the nation. This is reminiscent of Genesis 12 verses 1 and 2. Where God promised Abraham a blessing. Upon entry into Canaan. And is indeed a call based on that precise covenant promise. What I'm suggesting here is that when the author of Psalm 67 wrote these words here. He had Genesis 12 and the covenant promise that God had made to Abraham in mind. Here in Psalm 67, it is a call for God's glory to be seen among God's people, to glorify God's name, while at the same time allowing God's people to glorify God's name in the world so people will know that God is still alive and is a saving God. Let me repeat that. Here in Psalm 67, it is a call for God's glory to be seen among God's people to glorify God's name while at the same time allowing the world to encounter God's presence among us. So God blesses us not to make us special for ourselves, but God blesses us so we can be a blessing, as we saw earlier in an earlier sermon, so that others can see God in us and be led to glorify God. Verse 1 corresponds with verse 7, which ends the psalm on the same note, calling for people to bless, but giving an amplified rationale for the blessing that the world will have awe and reverence for God. By our lives, the world will learn to have respect and awe and reverence to God, his name and for God. Here's a lesson for us. Could it be that at times when we don't get the answer we are seeking through prayer, it is because we seek our glory and our satisfaction 
and not God's. God will do anything for us, anything that uplifts the name of God and that magnifies God's glory. God will do anything. Jesus says, there is no limit to what God can do for us. He says, according to your faith, be it unto you. The condition is, it must uplift God's name and magnify God's glory. In verse 2, we see that it ties in with verse 1 and strengthens the point that was just made. It gives the reason for the prayer of verse 1. It is for God to bless Israel. So God's law, God's way may be known on the earth. And for God's saving help, God's salvation that is experienced individually to be known to all nations. From this, we see our task as God's people, our task today. Please note, the sequence of events as outlined here in the chapter. One, a blessing from God that glorifies God's name. A blessing from God that glorifies God's name. Two, the blessing helps God's people but are visible to the world. Three, through us, this blessing reaches out to help others. For those who see this blessing will in turn glorify God's name. In sum, God blesses us to glorify God's name and blesses others so they will glorify God, not us, but God. We are to be lights and blessings to those who don't know God. Are you lights and blessings to the folks of the cities, the towns and the villages represented on this platform, whether it be London or it be Fort Lauderdale or it be Miami or it be Montego Bay or it may be Kingston, wherever you are, are you glorifying God? Verse 6 reinforces the point of verse 2. According to the covenant, blessings on the land were dependent on obedience to God's law. So blessings are the results of salvation, not the cause of it. You see, we are saved by grace, not works. God's blessings would be a weakness to the surrounding nations that Jehovah is the true and the living God, and the Savior of the world. My friends, that is still true today. When we share God's blessings with others, when they see God blessing us, then they know that our relationship with God matters, or being Christians matter. It means that they will see that if they follow us to obey God, God will bless them like God is blessing us. So God blesses us to bless others so that they can come to a saving knowledge of God's truth. So verses 1 to 2 then are a call to prayer at the beginning of the psalm. And the psalm ends with a prayer in praise of the results. Now verse 3 is a chorus. And remember these psalms were written to be sung. So verse 3 is a refrain, the chorus. It is a call to praise. Today many rile and protest the very mention of the name of God. One author says the nations have conspired to dethrone the Lord. They want nothing of his ways, end of quote. 
humanism, secularism, atheism, and agnosticism are holding sway. God has been removed from classrooms, from courtrooms, and legislative halls. The Bible is ignored, and we claim to be a post-biblical and a post-Christian society. Ellen White wrote long ago, there are despisers of our Lord everywhere who habitually throw contempt upon Christianity. They call it the plaything of children invented to impose on the credulity of the ignorant. Those who have no moral power can't stand in defense of truth. They have not the courage to say, quote, unless such conversation ceases, I can't remain in your presence. Jesus, the world's redeemer, is my savior. In him is centered my hope of eternal life. End of quote. Here's a question. When you are with your friends who are not Christians, do they feel free to say anything in your presence? Or do they sometimes refrain from saying things? Do they say, I would say that, but I won't because you are here? Do they respect you for the stand that you take as a Christian? Let's witness of Christ to the world. And let's invite our friends, or relatives, and don't, those who don't know the Lord to praise God. Let's witness to them, not only by our words, but by our lives as well. The story is told of a guy who worked in a coal mine, and he was always saying, thank you, Lord, praise the Lord, no matter what happens. He would say, praise the Lord. And one day as he sat down to eat his lunch, a dog came and grabbed his lunch and took it away. And his friend said, let's see how you're going to praise the Lord for that. And he says, praise the Lord, and ran after the dog. And as he moved away, there was an explosion in the mine, and all the others fell in and died. But he escaped because the dog took his lunch, and he was able to praise the Lord for that. In everything, give thanks. But you cannot praise God unless you have a testimony. Let me repeat that. You can't praise God unless you have a testimony. Do you have a testimony? Do I have a testimony? What is your testimony? Let's look at the word testimony for a moment. Let's play with it for a moment. Look at the word testimony. What is at the beginning of the word testimony? Isn't it a test? T-E-S-T? -E test. Test I, money. You can't have a testimony without a test. A test precedes a testimony. Ellen White says, nothing worth having is obtained without earnest preserving effort. Messages to Young People, page 259. We must endure or test and come through victorious to have a testimony. Yes, a testimony is a praise after a test. It is a song of victory after a test. What is your testimony? Do you have one? Here is mine. I am a miracle of God's grace. I shouldn't be here talking to you today. I should have died repeatedly. In baseball parlance, it says three strikes and you're out. I am seven strikes and still batting. 
And remember, seven is a perfect number, which means that seven strikes and still batting means more than seven. That's my testimony. And you'll hear a little more later. Verse five is identical with verse three and makes the same call, a chorus of praise for the doings of God. Are you giving God a chorus of praise for what God is doing in your life and for what God is doing on your behalf? I am sure there is no one on this platform this morning who can say God has never done anything for me. If you have never lied before, that would be your first lie. Because even being alive this morning to be here listening to the words of God is a miracle of God. It is a work of God. It is a blessing of God. It is something to praise God for. And so all of us can say right now, praise ye the Lord. This takes us to verse 4. And down to the brass tacks. Down to the heart of the matter. The very heart of Psalm 67. It is a call to thanksgiving. Yes, it is a call to thanksgiving. It invites the nations and us to shout for joy and sing because God is, a, is to judge and to govern. There can be no greater blessing to one than to be attracted into the kingdom of God. Nor can there be any event more worthy of celebration and joyous acclaim with songs of joy and thanksgiving than acceptance of the kingdom of God and entrance into its blessings. And here I'd like to emphasize that while we look for Christ to come and we want to go to heaven in the hereafter, God is giving us some of the blessings of the hereafter in the here and now. And we need to thank him and praise him for it because we can begin to live the joys of the hereafter in the here and now. Do you know why Christian life is so difficult? Let me share something with you. We live in the here and now which is this evil world. We anticipate the hereafter, but we begin to enjoy its blessing in the here and now. So, if you can see this, the Christians live, as Christians we live, where the circles intersect. The pull of the here and now and the pull of the hereafter catches us in the middle and squeezes us from time to time because we don't belong to this world and we are not yet in the world to come. So we are feeling the tension of living in both places. The devil is angry at us. So we feel the tension. And when we have that tension, it means God is with us. And that tension causes us to go to God in prayer and to invite him to be the director of our lives and to give us the strength to endure in this life as we enjoy the blessings of the hereafter in the here and now. My friends, this is what we live for. This is what salvation is all about. This is what Jesus came to die for. This is our primary task as Christians, restoring the image of God in fallen humanity, bringing them to the foot of the cross in praiseful surrender and joyous thanksgiving. The only thing better than thanksgiving 
is thanks living. Thanks living, living our lives in joyful, constant praise to God for God's salvation and God's daily blessings in our life. Remember, if a Christian isn't doing this, he or she needs to get her or his priorities straight. It is the heart of the matter. This is what church is about. If we're not bringing souls to Christ, we are missing the mark. Church isn't to get saints comfortable. It is to disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. Church isn't to get saints comfortable. It is to disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. That's what church is about. That is the heart of the matter. Right now, Jesus is our friend in court, our advocate, and our merciful elder brother. Soon, he will rise up to dispense justice as an unerring judge. Then there'll be no mercy, for the ark's door would have been forever shut. So, now while we have opportunity, we need to stand up, speak up, and attend to the heart of the matter. How will you fear that day, my friends? And here, let me share screen again for a moment and share with you what that structure looks like in Hebrew 6 to 7. So, I'm sorry, in Psalm 6 to 7. So, may a may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. That corresponds with may God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. B, so our prayers may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. B, the land yields its harvest, God or God blesses us. C, may the people praise you, O God. May all the people praise you. C, may the people praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. And at the heart of the matter, may the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations on earth. That is the heart of the matter in Psalm 67. So then, if Christ is to stand for us in the end, you will have to stand for him now. That's the heart of the matter. Solomon says, let's hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of humans. What is your song of victory? What is your testimony? Here's mine. Here is why I am what I am. Here is why I am a Seventh-day Adventist. My parents went on a Saturday to the Baptist minister, my mother was a Baptist, to plan their wedding. And the Baptist pastor would not see them. He told them, this is the Sabbath. I do not do business on the Sabbath. So had, they had to return home and go back on a day in the week to make those arrangements. So I like to say I was conceived Baptist, christened Anglican, baptized Seventh-day Adventist, because that introduction the Baptist pastor gave my mother caused her to become an Adventist. I made my own decision at eight and a half. The brethren didn't want to baptize me. They thought I was too young, but I insisted they baptize me. And three months after the baptism, I had a miraculous escape. 
when an earthquake destroyed the house in which we lived. All the debris from the house were beneath me in the bed. Nothing hit me until this day. I don't have a scratch or a pain, yet I got up from a bed that was covered with the debris and I was lying on top of them. Don't ask me how it happened. If I didn't experience it, I wouldn't believe it myself. When I went to Cornwall College, one day in class, Reverend Robertson, the pastor of the Birchell Baptist Church, uh, said that Paul went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. So I said, Reverend Robinson, which day is the Sabbath? And he said, Melbourne, sit down. You know that Saturday is the Sabbath. My, one of my friends, his member, went to him and said, what was that you said to Melbourne? And he said, Robert, the Adventists are right. But Sunday is an easier way to get to heaven. I don't know any easier way. I only know that it's a hard road to travel. I know I'm a Seventh-day Adventist because God is a Sabbath keeper. I believe in the Second Advent because that's God's promise to us. And Jesus said, he'll come again. That's why I am what I am. I've seen many leave. I have had causes to leave too, but enfeebled and defective as the church may seem. It is the only object on earth that has the supreme regard of God. Let me repeat that. I've seen many leave. I have had causes to leave too, but enfeebled and defective as it may seem. It is the church that follows closest the Bible teachings. That is why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. That's why I am here. But furthermore, I can see the providential leadings of God in the life. I was in an accident in South Africa on the trans guy on an afternoon, normally one cow kills five people in a car. There were five of us in my car. We killed one cow, not one cow unconscious. Nobody got hurt. The people looked at the car and said, the person who was sitting where I sat should have been dead but I'm alive telling you the story I was covered with blood and the doctors could not find one scratch on me my friends God is awesome God is great I know God's providential leading in my life I know God for myself I have a testimony because there's no one to me like my God and I invite you my friends ask God for a testimony endure the test so you can come through to have a testimony so then what will you do on that great judgment day my friend one day Daniel Webster in the midst of a group of gentlemen from the intelligentsia was asked in a hotel room in New York, Mr. Webster, what is the greatest thought that you ever had? Looking around the room before speaking, he asked, are all these friends? Well, I'm sure they were, he said. The greatest thought that ever came to me was my personal responsibility to the almighty God, my personal responsibility to the almighty God. That is the heart of the matter. What was your greatest thought? What is your greatest thought? Does it concern your eternal salvation? A renowned woman 
once asked Benjamin Jewett, Dr. Jewett, what do you think of God? Madame came the swift reply. The important thing, thing is not what I think of God, but what God thinks of me. The important thing is not what I think of God, but what God thinks of me. And what God thinks of you is dependent on what you think of God now. And the primacy you give to God in your life. What a change it will be when what we do is not dependent on what others think, what others say. When we are not seeking the approval or appreciation of others, but when we seek the approval of God. Friend, the heart of the matter is that when it comes to divine things and the kingdom, it's us and God alone. What's your relationship with God? Are you seeking to please God? Am I seeking to please God? Or are we seeking to please someone else? Are you standing for God and for right? Or for what someone else wants you to think, to say, or to do? Are you praising God? Or are you praising father, or mother, or son, or daughter, or someone else? What do you stand for? Where do you stand with God today? Not what you think of God matters, but what God thinks of you. What does God think of you today? Does it matter to you? It should. It's the very heart of the matter. What's your decision today? As for me, I'm going to serve the Lord and let his, this little light of mine shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. How about you? It is up to you and you alone. That's the heart of the matter. Dear God, thank you for this opportunity to praise your name. Thank you for this opportunity to see the heart of the matter. May each of us put you first and make you the heart of the matter in our lives is my prayer. Amen.